How to Stay Married for Good, Part 3, with some good advice for single people, too. The first two parts of this series are based on scientific research. If you wish to stay married for good, all you have to do is decide to follow the listed suggestions. It bears repeating to eliminate any contempt between you and your spouse. Contempt kills love. This presentation is based largely on my own observations and experience having been married for 26 years. When I recall most of the couples I witnessed getting married in their early 20s, I now think, what a fiasco in the making. Certainly, I would have been divorced by now if I had followed in their footsteps. In fact, I can't remember any young man who was prepared for marriage at that age, let alone starting a family. Everyone was stone deaf to the warning, look before you leap. I attended numerous weddings in my late teens and early 20s. The groom was handsome and the bride was beaming. The ceremony was dignified with solemn vows made to God, including for better or for worse. Note, sometimes the better comes after the worse. Afterwards, there was a great feast and heartfelt speeches. There was usually a raunchy moment when the bride's garter, sometimes illuminated by a spotlight, was slowly removed by the groom. Occasionally a short-lived tussle broke out in the ranks when the garter was flung into the crowd of gonzoed and salivating bachelors. Garters were often used to adorn the rearview mirrors of macho types. Fast forward a couple of years. I'm having a beer with a married friend at a local pub. A cute waitress passes by, and after eyeing her up and down, my friend makes, ooh, shall we say, an appreciative comment beginning with, I'd like to. Being relatively naive at the time, I was shocked and blurted out, but you got a beautiful wife. He cynically responded, uh, you'll find out, Jeff. His comment actually upset me, and I spent quite a bit of time contemplating his perplexing response. Fortunately, I spent most of my 20s at university and was in no position to get married. After graduating, I moved from Manitoba to Alberta to find work and found myself missing, missing the social connections I had back home. After all, in Manitoba, it was common to have church socials in honor of engaged couples to help finance their wedding plans. Guys and gals who wished to get married attended these alcohol-fueled events until nature took its course. Simple. When I finally got married at 31, I was truly sick of being single. I had gotten into the habit of recommending dating services to my lonely clients and decided to try one out myself. It was brilliant. After providing Mrs. Walls, a retired teacher, with some personal details, I described exactly who I wished to date. She rummaged through a pile of pink forms and matched me up with a few likely candidates. I looked at their resumes and attached Polaroid instant photographs taken of them on the spot by Mrs. Walls. I was allowed to jot down their first names and phone numbers and was instructed to phone the prospective gal and meet her at a restaurant. We were to pay for our own meals and to decide if we'd meet again after. Simple. Essentially, you could meet at least one new person per week until you clicked with someone. I went, it went something like this. Hello, Vicky. Yes. My name is Jeff. I got your name from Mrs. Walls. Would you be interested in going out Saturday night? I'd love to. Why don't people do this more often? It sure beats rejection at a bar. After a few dates, I gained considerable confidence, and when I met my future wife, it was easy to ask her out. Since we've been married, my subconscious reacts strongly to the rare thought of divorce by asking, do you want to go back to the dating game? Or worse, imagine the baggage. What I'm strongly recommending, especially for men, is to make sure you marry when you are truly sick of being single. Unfulfilled, adventurous elements in your personality can easily derail a marriage, especially in the first few fragile years. This rule may not hold as true if you and your lover came from very happy, intact families, and you both have strong desires to have children. Also, you can probably chance it if you both have mellow personalities that include a substantial belief in honor and are surrounded by stable family members, possibly with strong religious beliefs. Who should you marry? The more alike you are, the better in terms of age, social status, for example, white versus blue collar, education and religion. Though opposites attract, significant differences tend to drive couples apart over time. Before you begin your search for a partner, please consider reading Who Am I? The 16 Basic Desires That Motivate Our Actions and Define Our Personalities by Dr. Stephen Reese, a professor of psychology and psychiatry at Ohio State University. Spend the money, spend the time, you will be richly rewarded. Dr. Reese spent five years developing and testing a new theory of human motivation. After conducting studies involving more than 6,000 people, he found that 16 basic desires guide nearly all meaningful behavior. 
Who Am I?, contains some of the most profound and useful information I've come across since I started reading psychology textbooks in 1972. Not only is Who Am I well, well worth reading, but it contains self-tests designed to identify the desires that influence your personal decisions. The 16 desires, power, the desire to influence, manifests itself in leadership achievement and work. A person's choice of career is a clue to his or her desire for power. Those who always decline promotions are different than a prime minister, president, or chief executive officer. Independence, the desire for self-reliance, manifests itself in doing things one's own way and resisting advice from others. Some people are easily manipulated by others, while others stubbornly resist any influence at all. Why else would people refuse to wear seatbelts? Curiosity, the desire for knowledge, manifests itself in truth-seeking and problem-solving. Bookworms and inventors relentlessly seek out new knowledge, while others couldn't be bothered. Acceptance, the desire for inclusion, manifests itself in avoiding rejection and criticism. Risk-takers handle criticism better than those who usually set easy goals for themselves. As Virgil, the Roman epic poet, said, Fortune favors the brave. Order, the desire for organization, manifests itself in making orders, making rules, planning and low tolerance for messiness. Slobs tolerate messiness while clean freaks can't. They make poor roommates as illustrated in the odd couple movie. Saving, the desire to collect things, manifests itself in frugality, the squirrel gene. Some people pay off credit cards monthly while others pay, only pay the interest. Honor. The desire to be loyal to one's parents and heritage manifests itself in high character, morality, and principled behavior. Upon finding a wallet, one person may pocket the money, while another will deliver directly to the owner and not accept a reward beyond thanks. Idealism, the desire for social justice, manifests itself in devotion to causes, volunteer work and giving to charities. Social contact, the desire for companionship, manifests itself in socializing and the need for friendships. Some people cannot bear loneliness, while others are happy hermits. Family, the desire to raise one's own children, manifests itself in making child-rearing and day-to-day -day time with one's family a priority. Status, the desire for social standing, manifests itself in a concern with reputation. Some people need a mansion, Mercedes, and Rolex watch. Vengeance, the desire to get even, manifests itself in competitiveness and aggression. Some people play for fun, others need to win. Some turn the other cheek while others go postal. Romance, the, the desire for sex and beauty, manifests itself in courting and the pursuit of love. Some need sex often while others could care less. Large differences strain intimate relationships. Eating, the desire to consume food, manifests itself in eating, dining and cooking. Some people eat only when they are hungry, while others spend much of their spare time either eating or daydreaming about food. Physical exercise, the desire for exercise, manifests itself in physical activity and participatory sports, athletes versus couch potatoes. Tranquility, the desire for emotional calm, manifests itself in avoidance of stressful situations. The timid characters Woody Allen portrays are not the same as pilots, able to land fighter jets at night on aircraft carriers, or emergency room staff. By knowing your desires, it's easier to judge whether eligible partners are compatible with you. The more similar your desires, the less chance you'll clash in the future. If you have chronic arguments about the same issues in your current relationship, you likely have a conflict between one or more desires. Once identified, it's easier to come to some form of mutual agreement. For example, if one of you came from a very tidy family, and the other isn't bothered by clutter at all, you'll get on each other's nerves after a while. You can agree to keep most of the house tidy, but the less orderly person can have one sloppy room, which is never mentioned by the other. I have found that having shared goals is a great way to keep the spark alive in a marriage. All one has to do is take the time to think about how each of you wish the following factors to be in five or so years. Housing. What type? What neighborhood? What sort of features? Finances? How much debt can you handle? What should we do about investments? How about retirement plans? Family relationships? Children? Hobbies? Activities? Sports? How about philosophical and spiritual matters? 
Once your goals are sorted out, imagine what it would be like when you reach them. If reasonable, you'll likely at least come close to what you've wished for. Review your goals together regularly to see if you are on track. Make your most important decisions relative to your goals. Does X bring us closer or farther away from what we want? It's much easier to avoid temptation when you know what you want from life. Finances are one of the most difficult issues to sort out in marriages. Here are some tips I've found past the test of time. How much a person earns is usually directly related to the difficulty of the problems they solve for a living. Invest as much time and money as possible in your education, especially if it will lead to a solid job soon after you graduate. If at all possible, live beneath your income. Living near to where you work will dramatically reduce the amount of time you'll spend commuting and on transportation costs. Keep in mind, modern vehicles last at least 300,000 kilometers if properly maintained. Take your finances seriously and learn to make your money work for you. Magazines such as Money Sense are worth their weight in gold. Expect to live as long as your oldest relative and plan your retirement decades early. Attend a retirement seminar. Make extra payments on your mortgage whenever possible, such as bi-weekly payments. Avoid accumulating high interest credit card debt. Shun payday loan companies and pawn shops if at all possible. Gambling should be viewed as a form of entertainment only. Expecting to win the lottery or overcome the casino's advantage is sure folly.